always that. I tell you that I had a knee replacement last year, and so that became my part again. And I got another one I got to have. Um, but your, your part may be making a few phone calls. Getting on um, a Zoom um, call and then calling some people in power. I like this. Speaking to folks that can make change. Okay, so Jesus said, proclaim liberty to the captives. So we're going to be proclaiming liberty to the captives. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. So to set at liberty those who are oppressed, we do have to go to the oppressors. We have to speak truth to power. Sometimes our sphere of change may be our family, because that's our first ministry our neighborhood, or our community, our church, our city or county, our state or the nation. It may look different. Sometimes your, your part may be answering phone calls. Serving food. But we do have a part. I remember having a conversation with my dad, and I remember, you know, as I said, my dad pastored for over 30 years. Um, and he said to me one time, I am not political. I don't get political. And I had to say, but you have to. Jesus did. You don't have to be partisan. But you have to get political. We have to care about more than Sunday school and worship service. And Bible study. Those are important. But if we look at Jesus's ministry, he cared about the physical needs of people also. He met people at their point of need. And so if they were thirsty, he gave them something to drink. If they were hungry, he fed them. And I submit that at the church, that's what we should be doing. And then we need to go beyond that. Not just giving them a fish, but teaching them to fish and dismantling systems that don't even allow them to fish. Number four. It's your part. I'm going to tell you, last year we had people in the community we, um, actually calling people in their own communities, just reminding them of the importance of their vote. I like verse 26 in this um, this first Corinthian section that I wrote. It says, and it, we, we've already identified as many members in the body. But here he says, well, start at 20, um, 24, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism or no division in the body but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Number two. I like that old statement, um, we're not free until we're all free. So if you have some that enjoy food and some that can enjoy um, housing, and some that can enjoy the ability to um, thrive, and some that can get as much education that we that they can get. Um, shouldn't we all have it? And there's there's something that we all can do and should do. And that is like the one of the most important things that if, if we don't take away nothing else today, that advocacy is for everyone. Advocacy equals the church. The church equals advocacy. We have to care for one another. Jesus commanded us to love God and love our neighbor. He even expanded the idea of who our neighbor is beyond that what you could just look out your window. But a brother or sister in need. And we as the church have to do our part. We as the church 
have to speak out and, and, and do whatever it is that we can do to um, make sure we're pushing for the common good. That's what Jesus did. And if we don't do our part, let me go to the next slide. Something is missing. Something is missing. And so I ask you to think about what you're doing, what acts that you're doing. Who are you speaking out on behalf of? And make sure that whatever part that you call to be, you are not that missing part. As a PA, I'm gonna tell you, um, physically, it goes with this, what the scripture says, if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Um, as a PA, I've seen folks have strokes, you know, um, me, I had this knee replacement. Um, I've seen people with heart attacks, um, people having to get parts of their legs amputated. Heart attacks where part of their heart don't work quite the same. I remember when I went into um, a set of medically retired as a PA, and I started having problems where I felt, I started realizing I had elbows. I was like, you know, we know it, but I really shouldn't feel it. Um, then later on, um, being diagnosed, um, then, that's when it started when I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. But later on, I was diagnosed with um, pulmonary hypertension and I went into heart failure. And so parts of me weren't functioning right. And, and, and it took a lot of therapy and, and, and rehab and medications that at one point I was on medications that caused over twenty-some thousand dollars a month just for one of them, and that don't include all the other medicines. I have, uh, and and now on medications, one is around eight thousand dollars a month, one is around ten thousand dollars a month. I get grants to help with medication, but part of my body wasn't functioning, and I still got around, and I still was able to do things, but I felt the difference. I felt the difference. The absence of sometimes the feeling that being able to get even in enough air. I felt the difference. So the body was able to still keep moving and doing what it needs to do. And I'm thankful by the grace of God and the advancement of medications and treatments that I'm here today to be able to do some of the things I do. Because a couple of years ago, I was on a scooter and carrying oxygen around. So I'm thankful. But I can tell you physically, that's the same thing that happens in the church body when a part suffers or, or a part is even missing. You can go on, but you're not quite the same. That's just like what we've been putting together here. I know y'all was wondering, what are we doing? Why is she calling all these random numbers? If you see here, different shapes, different colors, different sizes, some same shapes and colors, but fitting in a little bit different. That's how we do in life with advocacy. That's how we do in life in the church in ministry. Advocacy is ministry to me. Speaking out for others. Because Jesus said, what you do for the least of these, you do unto me. So we got to care about the least of these. But are you missing? Are you that missing piece? What is your part? What does your part look like in here? And if you try to get in one way and it didn't fit, just turn it around and figure out where you do fit and how you fit. But don't withhold your talents. Don't withhold your voice. Don't withhold whatever it is that God has given you because then we have a piece missing in the puzzle. And we don't want you to be that missing piece. Is there someone that got number 20? Here's that missing piece. And when we put the missing piece in there, it fits right in. Now we're whole. And now we can do what we're supposed to do as the body. The church is advocacy. So what does that mean? You are advocacy. Because guess what? The church in this building. We are the church. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church, he wasn't talking about a physical building. Jesus ministered where people were. He ministered at their point of need. And we've gotten in the um, last century um, a misplaced 
idea of just what the church is. I tell you, um, have any of y'all watched the movie War Room? It's a powerful movie. I see a few people have. A powerful movie about prayer. But one of the favorite lines of mine when the two gentlemen was in the gym and he walked out, he was walking down and said, I see you at church tomorrow. And his friend said, I'd rather see the church in you. Powerful line. Why? Because we are the church. And the church should be wherever we are. So that means advocacy should be wherever we are. It's nice to have beautiful edifices like this so we can come together and fellowship and, and, and not forsaking the assembling together with others. But we have to remember that when we are in um, our communities, in our homes, on our jobs, in the grocery stores, picking up the phone call, calling whoever we have to call, the powers to be to make change, we are also the church then. So the church is very much involved in advocacy because the church is the advocacy. The person that established the church during his earthly ministry was out taking care of the needs of others. In fact, all the way to the cross, if we remember on the cross when he said, woman, be behold your son, son, behold your mother. One of the last, seven last statements on the cross was taking care of the needs of others. He wanted to make sure his mother was taken care of. And he's commissioned us to do our part. That's what the Great Commission is all about. When we go, that's what we have to do. We have to not be that missing piece. We have to speak out and speak up. I, and I really liked the one definition where it said public support or a re or, um, recommendation of a particular course or policy. And speaking on behalf of and in support of public support. Um, it's just like you can't be um, hidden and, 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 and speak out. We need to speak up and speak out. Um, tap into the needs of our communities and, and, and advocate on their behalf. And it doesn't matter whatever the cause or whatever the um, um, problem uh, may be. How can we meet those needs? Uh, so I can't um, exclude why I do it. Part of it is a very selfish reason. This is my why. My, my children, I have four adult children and I have nine grands. Got some more on the way. But my why is because I want, as they're parenting and as they're growing up, I want this world to be better for them. I want this world for, um, y'all talked about the earth. I want this earth safe for my, my grandson and existing. I want there to be some racial justice. So my grandson up there, um, those two that have dreadlocks aren't profiled before they can even get in a room. I want us to have racial justice and racial healing. I want them to not worry about how they're going to eat. I want their education not to be dependent on the zip code. I want them to be able to seek and access health care. And I want it for all of us, and I want it for the bigger communities. So that is my why. And then my goal, see, I was on vacation last year when these pictures were taken. And it was the first time I had been, actually been able to be on vacation. Two of my grands there were actually born in, um, during the pandemic in 2020. And I wasn't able to hold them for a while, quite a long time because my kids were very careful, as I stated, um, about my um, pulmonary and cardiac problems. And then because of um, rheumatoid arthritis and having problems with my immune system, I had to really shut down. And I was able to finally get with them and, and be with my grands and hug and hold them and take a picture with all of them. And so my goal is to be able to enjoy the rest of my life being able to just do that. I love, you, you heard 
know what I'm talking about? I'm a, I'm a physician assistant. I'm retired from physician assistant. And I'm organizer. And I'm a certified Christian counselor and a minister and all these things. But mama and nana tops any of that. That's my why. And we all have to find that why in us. Jesus had a why. When Jesus came, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever. So Jesus came to this world for whosoever that believed in him. He loved us that much. So we have to find our why. I, I, I take it personal. I take that personal that he came for me. And then I also take personal my why when I go out for them. And then you find that why, and I go out for the community. And that's what we have to find. Make sure that we're not missing. And I'm really ready for my rocket chair. <laughs> I'm ready to be in a world that I don't cringe when I turn on the news. I'm ready to just be able to sit in my backyard and watch my grands run wild. I'm ready for that, to constantly be on vacation with them. But in the meantime, I'm going to make sure this world is better, better for them. So that's my why, and that's my goal. And I need y'all to have a why and a goal. And I need you to tap in. If you, you may not um, be called to advocate for the same things that we have called. Y'all have had a summer lecture series on so many different things of transforming this world. Find your why. Tap into it, find your place, whatever your place may be, however it looks, however it turns, find that and tap into it. I can help you. If you need um, something, get my number down, get my email address down. I can help you. We'd love to tap in with us with Faith in Public Life as we make sure we have a safe democracy for everyone and everyone can access health care. But if that's not quite your call, and I'd love, I want you on the boat and joining in on this train. Um, but if that's not your assignment, that's okay to find it. And I can help you plug into that. But we have to have a why outside of us. We have to have a why outside of us. Again, the church is advocacy. And if you are a part of the church, you are the church. The church goes with you. That means your voice and your advocate will go with you. And I'm going to stop here and see if we have any questions or comments. I'm not in this by myself. Tell me what you're doing right now. What is your spot in advocacy? We have somebody we have pick on you who I see on Zoom. On, on, on your why and what you what what you feel called to with Africa advocate. That's good, um, and that's one of the things that we do during legislative session. Our, our legislators meet between um, January and the end of March, early April, and we um, we're on on Zoom. We call it coffee at the Capitol. At one point, it was in person, and of course, everything transitioned. But one of the things, the beauties of the transition is that we've been able to um, tap in throughout the state. 
um, to bring more people into the process. Um, my biggest place to advocate, and I'm here um, in Atlanta with y'all, but rural Georgia is where my heart is. I was born in Blythe, Georgia. And my grandfather pastored in out there somewhere in rural Georgia all throughout. He was at um, different places in Glasscock County, in, in, in Warren County, in Thompson, in McDuffie County. Um, and, and rural Georgia is my heart because frequently um, there's um, communities and there's, there's areas that's cut off uh, from the process. And so Coffee at the Capitol, what she mentioned that is her part, we've been able to bring um, folks in online and just let them know what's going on, what bills are um, uh, um, up for discussion or um, up for vote so that um, if they can voice the needs of their communities. And sometimes we have to be that voice. Anybody else have give me some other ways? What you think that the church can do to advocate? The church's place in advocacy. Yes. Absolutely, I, I, I love that. And 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 um, some may think it's medicine. Um, for those that may not have heard, it was talking about um, public education and finding a conviction to be concerned about public education. And um, you're right on the heels of um, Brown um, versus Topeka, um, the, the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. A lot of private schools was founded. Um, and then funds is taken out of public school education. And, and, and what that have done is increase racial disparity when it comes to public education. One of our partners, um, GBPI, and they, we partnered with that. I, I don't know if you remember education was one of the things that I have mentioned. They talks about education funding. And in and, and, and a lot of ways, Georgia is one of the states that do not have funding that meets the gap. So there's no equity. You can't have equality without equity. Does anybody know the difference? Does anybody know the difference between equality and equity? So equality says we're gonna make sure we give everybody the same thing. Equality is gonna make sure we try, we give everybody the same thing. And in Georgia, part of um, equality with education is we're going to have property taxes fund public education. That's what equality is saying. But because of that, there's no equity. There's a disparity in education, in public education, because in communities where pro um, property taxes may be lower, that particular school gets less money. Typically, those are the communities with black and brown folks, with marginalized communities that are getting further marginalized because they're not even getting the same education. And so equity says, we recognize there's a difference. So what we're going to do is come in and bridge that gap. And Georgia don't do that. There, there are states that do that. Georgia is one of the states. It's one of the things we fight for. Georgia is one of the states that don't do that. And that's a worthy cause. They don't close the gap. And so you have some schools without new books, some schools without new computers, without the technology children need, without the, the um, school books children need, without the staff that children need. Because we can't have equality without equity. There's no justice in that. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, my God. 
the church can advocate by being a bridge to resources for the community? Yes. The church can advocate by being a bridge to resources in the community. Absolutely. And I would love if churches was actually the bridge, could be that bridge to resources in the community. And a lot of churches are. One of the things that I've found over the years is that churches fill in the need, whether it's clothing or school supplies or internet and technology or food or helping with um, rent assistance or helping with a health, be a health um, care bill. And so churches have been doing that when we have legislators offering thoughts and prayers. So if we can have the legislator, you know, and good policies pushed so that people can thrive, so that we don't have to um, provide food, wouldn't it be a, a wonderful community where everybody have all the food they need if we don't have food insecurities? But the churches have to actually be that resource, but it would be nice if churches could be the bridge and could tell folks where to go for the resources because we've had enough public policies in place that everybody in the community can thrive. Because when one suffer, we all suffer, as scripture says. But the scripture also says, when one is honored, we all rejoice. Anybody else? Yes. I'm familiar with uh, vaccines and inequity in other parts of the world where mm -hmm. they cannot afford the basic doctor's mm -hmm. immunization. Yes. And so that concept seems easy for people to grasp that they cannot afford U.S. prices for their childhood vaccine until there's all this movement to mm -hmm. provide them. Mm -hmm. But I've missed the inequity and the gap in education. I, you're the first time I've, it sort of clicked with me. So I'm kind of shocked, even within my own mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because healthcare inequity is in the news now? Probably. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned that about vaccine inequity, like in other countries where folks can um, afford childhood vaccines. But do you know vaccine inequities exist right here? Right here in the state of Georgia. So um, in between election years, we was in, we're still in the middle of a um, COVID um, pandemic. I um, worked really hard and diligently on a COVID vaccine um, um, campaign. Because the inequities in vaccine, let me tell you a little bit about the inequity in vaccine. Here in Georgia, everybody don't have rule, uh, have, don't have internet connection. A lot of the places I go, I have to take it. Here in Georgia, everybody don't even have good cell phone connection. And so when the vaccines rolled out in, um, for the COVID-19 vaccine, first of all, before they rolled out and while they rolled out, myths, disinformation and misinformation rolled out and kind of spread further and faster than the vaccines did. So the campaign we did was first dispelling myths, disinformation and misinformation. Misinformation is wrong information. Disinformation is wrong information too, but it's intentionally wrong information that can cause harm. And so we went on a campaign to do that, but in the process of finding that, you know, you could go online and schedule your appointment for the vaccines. Well, how are you going to do that if you're in a community without internet? Or so they say, okay, well, you can call and make that appointment. Okay, but you got to get that number off the internet or have had somebody access to social media or something like that. There were so many inequities. There are communities that I work in that didn't have chain pharmacies. May or may not have a health department. And, 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 and that's where right here in our state, we found vaccine inequities. And so we were going on the, in the parking lots and handing out food or handing out school supplies and having somebody over there ready to do vaccines too. So we could bring them to the people because there are inequities that exist right here. There are so many places in, in rural Georgia where folks cannot access the care they need. Hospitals closing down, there's no primary care or specialty care. And as a PA, and I, used, I worked in emergency medicine in rural Georgia, one of the things I noticed is the further somebody um, lives away from emergency care, the, the chances of worse outcomes. When you can't act some, say someone with a stroke, care for a stroke or, or a heart attack or a hypertensive crisis or a diabetes crisis, 
the outcomes were worse. And what we also found is also marginalized communities that was having to deal with that. So that's, I'm glad you, um, you, brought, you, you brought that up. And there's actually a tie between healthcare and education inequities. Yes. Someone in the discipline who wanted to help learn that resource and that is the way that way of expressing that way of what would be the best way for someone to hear what you're doing. There's a lot of organizations that's doing it. You can call me, text, uh, text me, email me, because that's one of the biggest things we're doing in order to um close the gap in everything that we've talked about. Well, first of all, voting rights is um, so important. So we're providing information so that folks know how to vote. Our voting laws have changed. These last two legislative sessions have made significant changes to our voting laws. And so just making sure people are educated. And then we're also running a faithful voter program through churches and congregations, getting people to pledge to vote. And we're asking those that vote all the time, you lead the way, you take the pledge, show others and get folks to pledge to vote so that we can first cross match it, make sure that um, the data matches in vain because we are a state that purges. And then what we also have several contacts between now and the election, depending on how the person has decided to vote. So that we can actually encourage them to get back out to vote, remind them of their pledge and the, and the importance of their vote. There's some people just now finding out just how important their vote is. Just took someone in a primary that's 63 years old that vote for the first time. And that's a good, but because of the education that we provided. And we love to partner with individuals in, in the community and, and with churches and faith leaders um, with our Faithful Voter Program, where we can get people to pledge to vote. And we have pledge cards or a link to pledge um, online. And so please call my number. We um, Voting rights is so important to get education um, and equity, access to health care um, and affordable health care and um, Thriving families where folks can have um, homes and not deal with food insecurities and um, other economic justice issues. Voting is the very basics. And, 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 and making people be informed, but making sure folks are informed voters. If those are in, on, in the chat can't see my um, information, if you would share it, it's perfect. Because they can also join in. Let's get on this train together. Because that's the basics. Uh, uh, making sure everybody have access to the ballot and then making sure their ballot is counted. Anybody else? This is about, almost time to wrap up. Yeah. But I do appreciate everybody um, being here um, and joining us. Did I have anything? I appreciate I appreciate the offer to um, the invite to come and join y'all today. Um, it's been a pleasure. This is this is my passion and this is my why. And, and, and it was great to come share how we as a church are advocates. Okay. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Will you pray for us as a church before we leave that we'll take heed to these words and be, be advocates, be the church? Yes. Yes, sir. Anything else? Let us pray. God, we come to you today. Just want to thank you, first of all, for just allowing us to be. Thank you for um, sending your son here to, um, to advocate for us, but not only advocate for us, to show us how to be advocates for others. Lord, you gave us the mandate to love you with our everything, but also to love our neighbors as ourselves. So I ask right now that you, you open up our hearts, open up our minds, and, and, and allow us to, to use what we have to advocate on behalf of others. I ask you to, to illuminate that path and just to allow those here um, that knowledge of what our place is, what our piece is, our, our piece is, because we recognize all good things come from you. We recognize the gifts come from you, but we are a part of the body. And I ask you right now to strengthen us to, to bolden us, to empower us to go out and be your hands and be your feet 
and advocate for the, the world. We thank you that you are a just God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. I ask right now that you allow us to apply some of that grace and apply some of that mercy to ourselves on our walk, but also to our, our neighbors so that we can love them just like you love them. And so we can go and advocate on the, their behalf. Collectively and individually, I ask that you open up our hearts and illuminate our minds to do our part. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, that died for us so that we may be saved. And as we pass on your love and salvation, we're also going to be helping our neighbors. And I ask all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.